1973, when a group of folks started thinking about making our own food co-op a better service to our community, they first queried an expert on change, their friend Bill Boylant. Assumption of fact one is that membership lists of the cooperative do not presently exist, or if they exist, exist only in the form of card files, which were begun on Wednesday. The second assumption of fact that I'll make is that you do not know who your directors are. The only directors who were really ever chosen were chosen some years ago in Cindy and Harve's dining room, and I'm not even sure that you still have the list of those names. I'll make a third assumption of fact, and that is that to the extent that you have officers at all, they are your coordinators. And now I'm going to leave fact and go to law for a minute. Law is corporate law. Law is non-profit corporate law, which I would ask you to remember is really 1930 law, which was taken from profit-making corporate law. So you are asking yourselves, and I guess all you need to do is take a look at yourselves in the way you think to realize that you're asking yourselves to operate within a field which was designed by, for, and on behalf of people who sit in boardrooms and manage large amounts of capital and boss around large numbers of employees. I'm not sure that that situation about boardrooms and capital and employees is quite your situation. And we knew that from the start, so we tried to tailor your rules to fit your situation. Now, we're allowed to do that as lawyers so long as we keep you within general lines of corporate responsibility. Those general lines of corporate responsibility are called bylaws. And we drew up some bylaws, and they've never been filed with anybody except the IRS for only record keeping purposes. And, and it's up to you to change those as your situation requires it. Before you change your corporate bylaws, you should consult with your lawyer. And your lawyer will tell you lots of things like keep good records and make lists and all of those things that lawyers always say and that clients never do, and you guys never did it. And now, as I understand it, you're engaged in reorganization. Reorganize as follows, please, and you'll fit within your bylaws. Any other changes that you would make would probably require the changing of your bylaws, which can be done, but which means that we have to sit down and talk about how to do that legally. You're set up to have memberships, and those are the memberships you haven't kept track of. Once your membership is discernible, that membership is called together and it elects directors. Now those directors are intended to manage the corporation, to set its policy, to meet as often as it thinks it ought to meet, and to perform a third task, which is to select officers. The officers are the people who are responsible to the directors for the day-to-day -day management of the cooperative or the corporation, whichever you choose to call it. In turn, the directors are responsible to the membership, and the membership is responsible to itself. There's one change that is legal, but that is different from most corporations, at least most profit-making corporations. Most profit-making corporations have as their only members the board of trustees, and that is so that a very few people can carry on a very, very highly technical uh, financial kind of, of arrangement. And I don't know that you have a highly technical financial kind of arrangement, but that's a decision that you have to make. Please pick out the way you want to govern yourselves and then check with us lawyers and we'll tell you what minimal changes you have to make to make it fit the law. The chances are, being the law-abiding folk that you are, that you're going to come up with something that's perfectly legal anyway. Please don't worry about legalities, and that's what any lawyer will tell you. Worry about workability, and it's the lawyer's job then to to make that workability fit with what is legal. And uh, we think we can do that. You have a nice meeting. So the food co-op regular workers called a meeting of other friends and buyers to determine policy, such as how many days will we be open. But can they determine policy, or does it take the decision of everyone who uses the food co-op? This meeting was called in accordance with our bylaws to reform the position of this board. The 16 members, functionally and historically defined, were all personally notified of this meeting. They are Bill Boyd, Diane Boyd, Julie Boyland, Chris Brown, Elaine Bueller, Jay Bueller, John Klein, Ralph Dix, 
Cindy Forsberg, Jim Hallis, Lou Hennefeld, Carol Kalin, Mark Kalin, Jim Cool, Chris Lortz, Steve Luce. When was that board done? It, that's coming. It, you let me finish. It'll take two minutes. You know. All right. Decisions at this meeting will be made by a two-thirds majority of the board president, providing a quorum is present. A quorum is present that two-thirds majority is stated in the bylaws. The minutes from yesterday's meeting, which was called by Bill Boyd, John Klein, and myself, and attended by Chris Brown, Bill Boyd, John Klein, Ralph Dick, Cindy Forstag, Lou Hennepel, Carol Kalen, and Mark Kalen. <coughs> and the members were unable to contact or the rest of that list. The purpose of that meeting was to discuss the method in which as stated by Bill, was to discuss the method in which criticism can be included in the management and direction of the co-op. Bill Boyd felt that as things stood, people with opposing views felt that they had to leave and that a more constructive atmosphere for change was needed. As discussion continued, it was agreed upon that the whole board should make any necessary decisions in a board meeting using the input of the people it assembled. It was agreed that the board consisted at the present time of the following people, alphabetically of that list. It was agreed, uh, finishing the minutes, it was agreed that in accordance with the bylaws that a two-thirds majority of a quorum would be necessary to make a decision, each board member having one vote. It was agreed that the first order of business would be a motion and vote to potentially reaffirm this board's historical and legal role as the decision-making body of the Columbus Community Food Club. Once this was accomplished, it was recommended that we determine how to expand and share the decision-making role of the board with the community. An advisory council agreed upon last month was recommended. Okay. The names that you've called off, that indeed that they were the board, and that that had all been shown out to them that, hey, this is what you're supposed to do. I would never have been going to those meetings because, because I feel that is not a representation of the community. Mm -hmm. We did not say to ourselves when we first became a buyer, packing chickens or doing anything, that, hey, this is your position right here, as it says in the bylaws. People just came to the meetings. Right. And at one point, we suggested that people that were buyers come to the meeting in order that they would know what was going on. But if I felt that that was the, indeed the decision making, you know, as it stood, according to the bylaws, I would have had nothing to do with this. But unfortunately, you called out my name. <laughs> and I thought I was just there as a person attending a meeting and that if I wanted to bring my mother along she would have a vote too of course uh, if, if she lived in the community or felt a part of it I mentioned something and I think that really if I can speak to it it might clear things up a little like she was saying well no one asked us to do this we volunteered and therefore and what you were trying to do so you, you mentioned that which is a true statement but but you skipped a step and you ended up trying to try to support the fact that you've got the power to make decisions more than anyone else does. Well, the point is, it would seem to me, when I work in the co-op, you know, uh, I hesitated to do it for a while, and then I got to really dig it. You know, and, oh, I dig it. I like to work there all day sometimes. But you know, a lot of people do that. Um, it's you're there, as, you're there as a servant of the people. And that's your decision right there. I want, to, I want to give this person this. I want to give this person this, you know. That seems to me to be the basis of the whole work operation in the co-op, is you're a servant of the people. You've got no, no there's, there's nothing that goes past that. There's no way that working in the co-op gives you some kind of, some kind of one-upsmanship, being able to say, well, since I work at the co-op, that means I can tell the co-op what to do. Because the co-op is still the members, the people who need the food. Would you, would you tell an old lady who couldn't come to the meetings, who couldn't work, that she couldn't vote? going along quite slowly actually on changing the co-op or on making those decisions. We made the decision on how to make a decision in a big meeting that was already decided. And we're slowly working on other ideas. It can be worked out in a large forum. Uh, uh, if this, say this group makes some kind of a decision. Well, what does that mean? It's 15 people and then the, the and then the group that meets on Thursday, which is the general group of people, the, where it's an open meeting, so they make a contrary decision. This was why I'm saying. Why make these two decisions? Why work it twice? And we all just get together in a big meeting when everybody's invited and work things out on decision making, on change, and the proposals written down and you know thought about. And that's what we were talking about. We've got to do it much more democratic. It should the co-op should be a community of people who will hire uh, ten administrators to run something. And the decisions have to be made by the people in the community. They, they, we just hire administrators. We don't hire leaders. Oh. Here, here. 
I think that that's absolutely correct. But the thing that we're trying to determine is how does that community make those decisions? Well, okay, All, then why yeah, tonight a closed group? If we're just trying to figure out how the community makes decisions, <laughs> why would only 15 members of the community try to figure that out? Why they not more? That is not, that is not what's happening. We're trying to come up with a structure that will facilitate those kinds of changes. Uh, we've got one group one week, and then now we've got this group, which I think sort of exemplifies the fact that you get a lack of structure. <coughs> No. Uh, you gotta have like, this, it sounds yeah. like it's coming back to the same thing, though. You came together as a board to decide how you're going to allow people to make decisions. And, the people. and I don't understand how you came up with that power to begin with. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, people who put a lot of work in the last two, three years into the co-op, and you've, you're into the running of it, and you say, well, look, we kind of like to talk about it and put our views forward. In, this, in Thursday night when there are going to be a lot of other folks who have obviously gotten in their little groups and gotten their shit together. I don't see why you've, you've invited this confrontation. You've invited it by making it secret, Mr. Chairperson. You've invited by your speech when in the beginning you set up the fact that this is the board and so and so in the bylaws. It's just absurd. If you just admit that you're concerned folks who, are, who were a board or are a board, and that you came here to talk about some problems, and that you that these inputs you're going to talk about tonight are going to yeah. just be put into the meeting Thursday night. I think that's well said, Cindy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think your point is, is very good. Statement of purpose that was written two and a half years ago, which I think we can still agree on. It's the what? The, are there two paragraphs there? The, the, the specific and primary purposes are to provide the best possible food at the lowest possible price to the members of the corporation and blah, 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 to support to the greatest extent possible other organizations devoted to the fostering of community control over the destinies of the community. Is that is is that still what we feel two and a half years later? Yeah, I think what she's Could saying. Could we get consensus on the affirmation of those two principles? I really I really call for consensus. Well, um, I'm not sure that they're sufficient we, because we, I can just, I well, can envision they may not a way that the food co-op could be structured internally so it could be totally undemocratic and still meet those requirements. Sure. Yeah, well, I agree with that. How do we plug in the community? Well, it's like one thing that's been consistently bothering me is that I keep hearing people wanting to make distinctions between um, the membership and the board, uh, the consumers and the people who run the co-op, the community and the food co-op, and I thought that the whole object was to try to minimize that distinction to the point where it no longer existed. But right now it does exist. There are people who, for example, an agenda is binding in that on the side. Oh, oh, we're not binding. Yeah, yeah, I think we saw it. It's so easy we changed the agenda. Here it is. 16 to 30 years. Wow. The best way, if this group wants to sit down and make a proposal for change, let's do it. Uh, and all you can do is bring it up. Uh, we'll just add it on the group list of other things that are necessary to be changed and necessary to be worked on on Thursday. We're pretty busy working on the proposal that's on the floor, and there hasn't really been adequate possibilities for input about that proposal. Oh, that's not true. We've only gotten through one point. We've only had one meeting already. In one point in one meeting, that's not, yeah, you know. We still got a lot of points left to go in more meetings. You must know that, that there has been no constructive work on that. And the atmosphere which has been pervasive... In I, well, first of all, don't even go any further because you can't say there's been no constructive work at all. There's been a lot of work. We've got three quarters of the people to agree on community development. That's quite a bit of work. No. At the open meeting of the food co-op that Thursday before, it was decided that all the profits of the food co-op would constitute community development. Prior to this, only 4% was added to the marked up price, and only this set-aside fund would be donated to the community organizations for its development. Well, there's six days a week. That's already been voted on. And next Thursday, we'll work on more. Those changes are already being made. We don't have to discuss how they're going to be made since there is no binding force to this group. If this group of 15 people wants to make a decision that the co-op will not open six days a week, I mean, there's nothing that's going to bind it if they're whole, the, the majority of the people want to open that way or, such, or want to change that way. We don't need a closed meeting on Monday. We should just come on Thursday with the rest of the people and make our decisions. 
I mean, I mean, granted, it may have been made this way before. The, the board has made decisions. But evidently, there's a way to do it differently. And it's already been moving. It's been moving very democratically. We've taken our time. You know, well, look, at we've, we've opened it. We've had the meetings open. We even decided to, to write down the, the uh, suggestions, discuss them out slowly, take an extra week or two. That's much more democratic than having 15 people sit around a room, whoever it's called, and, and make decisions like that. On how the, what direction should we take? On the actual, if you want to set up a board of directors to administer the thing, okay, but they shouldn't have any decision making. Showed up on Thursday night, we considered the board and made decisions. Like how well publicized were things on Thursday night? Because I never knew there was a meeting on Thursday night, and I've been really interested in the co-op, and I never knew there was such a thing. This like, Thursday? No. Any I mean, Thursday. just any Thursday. When last everybody's Thursday been getting together and making No, last Thursday was the first one. It was the first one that was really publicized. And they advertised it at the um, But at that's the what I'm saying. Why weren't that? they publicized if this was supposed to be, you know, you're allowing it to become an elite thing? That's what happened. It did become that. Yeah. And I think this co-op board realizes that that's a definite mistake. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. How are you going to do something to change it instead of bickering about this is what happened, but... Yeah. Let's move forward and, you know, to hell with the past. You've made your mistakes, get over them, and let's go. Among the issues discussed at the next open meeting was how items were marked up, whether uniformly or arbitrarily, and where the markup would occur within the price or at the cash register. Adopt and use the 10% on cost markup. Shelf. On the shelf. And then a markup of the cash register. And then that, the well, the four percent for redevelopment. So they have broken down two ways operating expense and community development. Operating expense was included in the price. Now, what will be done this time? Will there still be two markups or uh, just the one combined markup? Well, that's what we're trying to decide. What he, the way what he, he proposed it, is it just one markup? What he has proposed is that there's no markup put on it when you put it on the shelf. Mm -hmm. That when they get to the cash register, um, you add the 10% um, operating expense, and okay. then if they have not moved <coughs> in the community in, the, in that month, you add the other 10%. Just out of curiosity, wasn't this voted down two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. well, are we talking about, can I have that clarified? No. About two weeks ago, the 10% No, that was the standard, op, st standard markup that was, op, as opposed to a, um, what, an individual markup. Even if there were signs stating that there would be a 10% hike on the um, prices that were written on the products, if somebody were in there and he, they were only able to spend a specific amount of money, it would just, again, be more of a hassle for that individual to figure it out. Well, I'm just concerned about these people that have to go and add 10% to everything. I don't know, maybe it won't be a job, but to go and write 10% uh, 900 times in the co-op is a lot harder than putting it out one order for sure. Yeah, but they're going to, you know, if they have a price change during the week, they're going to have to, I mean, in other words, once you got your 10% up, they get a new price. I mean, you got to figure out your price anyway. And you add the 10% up. And every time you have a price change, it's going to be the same hassle. Whether you're adding the 10% or not, you're going to have to sit down and figure out new prices. And it's just, you know, like, um, when, when the case of oranges goes up 50 cents, you have to figure out how much each orange costs. And figure out that each coin there, each orange, each orange costs a certain amount. Adding the extra ten percent on isn't that much more work. Once you've initially done it, right. unless you actually add the ten percent to the case cost and how much it's going to cost. Okay, but there also may be a difference in that, as far as that goes. By adding the thing I brought up was I think the ten percent is a hidden charge if you don't put it on at the end. It's, it's 
because people will never know anything about it. They won't know. Let's see if I can get this straight. To have the price on the shelf be indicated what it costs to get it there. No. Yes. Just to get it to the door. And then at the cash register, you will pay either an additional 10% or an additional 20%. Which that markup will indicate. Okay, all those people in favor, please raise your hands. Six. All those opposed? I think it's 11. I've got the co op uses a 10% on cost markup system as the general system of markup for the food on the shelf. Second. Second. Any discussion or questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm bringing up the same question I did before. I thought that two weeks ago uh, yeah, the did. proposal for a uniform 10% markup was voted down. No, no, no that, that was passed. passed. Yeah, that was yeah. passed. Right, right. <laughs> Fine. Uh, by going to like an overall <coughs> markup, just for the obvious advantages of making it easier to determine markup on all goods, also it will help bring down even some of the prices of produce and organics and maybe even some dairy products. A lot of people shop the co-op for the purpose of getting good buys on produce. A technique that a lot of supermarkets have found is that, you know, you've seen in their advertisement, you know, lost leaders where they sell something a lot cheaper. People come in to buy that, and then they know that once they get somebody in their store, they're not going to want to truck all over the city. They'll probably buy the other things that they have there also. So it seems to me that, like, uh, some of the essential foods, you know, like produce and organics, which are healthier foods, you know, than the, the canned, you know, goods that, you know, most you know, that these people are buying. It could it'd be nice in a way if the you know co-op can in a way kind of encourage people to by having better prices that they can start buying fresh vegetables. And uh, you know it's also fair to these you know to these items. Gonna ask the man over here. I'd like to point out that uh, the dry goods prices will go up some, although when you include the four percent in there they're already at ten percent pretty much. And uh, produce prices, well, they've just been changed. They are 10% now. Organics will come down 10%. Yogurt will come down 10%. Cheese will come down 15%. Bread will probably stay somewhere where it is. <coughs> and so, overall, prices are coming down. You're next, then. I just want to ask if people really think that it's fair that some people who don't buy canned goods are taxed in favor of people who do buy candidates. Yeah, so, question, is there any response yeah, specifically to that question? You've yeah, spoken uh, I, in that, and every department is not losing money. If what you're saying is certain departments contribute less <coughs> to the welfare of the co-op, but no one is losing money for the co-op. Uh, did you have something to say it's specifically to that point? Kind of that everybody buys some canned goods at some time. Okay. Okay. Tax I tax tax Part of the, one of the three main things this co-op is, besides being a food cooperative and uh, making some money for the community, is to provide nutritional food <coughs> and to try to show people nutritional food. Now, one of the ways we our eating habits are determined has to do with economics. When you're a kid, when you're growing up, you have a small, a certain amount of money, and if you're rich, you can usually buy the good food. Like organics, if you are into good foods like that, or good meats, you got to pay a lot of money. And the rest of us who don't have a lot of money usually have to buy the white breads, the canned goods, the cheaper shit. And I think that would be a good idea for the co-op to do just the opposite. You make all the good foods, bring the price down, and the shittier foods, well, the price would either go up or stay basically the same. You know, and, you know it's usually the guy who hasn't got a lot of economics gets hurt. Maybe. But this way, he would go into the higher foods. Uh, you know, I haven't asked. Uh, eventually, bringing the dry goods down, it's not going to happen as, as, as far as, as I can see. And, like, you know, competitiveness shouldn't be happening. Education is, is I think, a good advantage of a uniform markup. People who come into the co-op, if everything is marked up 10%, they can learn something about the food distribution system, something about they know what the co-op paid for the item. If I come in and something's marked up 3%, something else is marked up 
I don't know without doing a lot of asking around what the co-op pay for that. I don't learn very much about the sewage distribution system that we're dealing with. Okay, uh, let me state what is probably obvious to all of you that this issue is really a, what is that? Goods are, dry goods is really the question that we're talking about, obviously. Uh, one of the things that uh, Chris Brown brought up once before that I really think is important to remember, uh, we pay, we don't pay for the real cost of food in a lot of ways, and we don't ask people to pay for the real cost of food. If you mark up dry goods 6% and you mark up cheese 25%, we're not asking people to pay for the real price of the food involved. You know, there's something really important about that, I think, in, in making, you know, the energy exchange really valid in the sense of, now I know what you're trying to say about making adjustments and judgment, you know. I agree that the, the spirit ought to rule rather than an absolute, absolute rule. There are problems with dry goods and eggs. I see people paying more money for eggs than they know they could if they went somewhere else, because I've been working eggs the last two days, quite a few hours, and believe me, people are not that upset about it. They recognize that, as some people have said, when they leave the, the co-op, their bill is cheaper. They do like themselves. It's not that someone would necessarily go for canned goods, you know, to another store. It might be that they'd be willing to accept another 30 or 40 cents that it would be because at two or three dollars they're going to save someplace else, and they don't want to go someplace just for canned goods or for taxables. It's because of a lack of imagination, I honestly think. Now, of course, that's prejudice, maybe, or maybe it's just a desire to do better. You know, but I think it's partly a, a lack of imagination that we have the problem with taxables and dry goods. We do. I think it can be solved. I think part of it is that we're not paying our bills, that if we paid our bills, we could use more imagination, get on better price lists with different distributors whom we'd have to be prompt with because they need bread, too, because they're small. You know, I mean, like, that's the way it works. And I think if we'd use that kind of imagination rather than this defeatist trip, you know, we might, we might solve the problem. In the meantime, there might be adjustments. But frankly, 10% is worth shooting for, and it's, it's a risk. You know, unless you're going to take 12, you can't cut down to 6, 10 if you've got a hold. That's, what I, that's part of what we're saying. And we'd like to make it fair because why not? It says in the bylaws, it says in the bylaws, no, not the bylaws, the articles of corporation. The reason why we got together was to sell the best possible food at the best possible price, period. It didn't say modifications, and I think, not, not that we have to abide by that, but it's such a clear principle. The best possible food, the best, co you know, the best, co well, this is the best we can do on this, this is the best we can do on this. And if the spirit of the co, I'm, I'm talking over a minute. Well, that's okay. The vote must be three quarters. Uh, did you count the number present and what three quarters is that number may have changed? I'm afraid the number may have changed. It was 36 originally. We can just add them up and then see if the ratio Okay, let's see how close we are. Wait a minute, can I make a clarification on that? Yes, you may. The motion is a straight 10%. That doesn't mean 10% of them, 4% of the cashier is straight 10%. It means a when, straight... When, the price, when you figure out the price <coughs> that it got there to the co-op, and you mark it up 10%, that's the price. Sure. Straight 10% across the board. No 4%, no 10%. Straight 10% across the board. In favor of having a 10% uniform price markup, raise the hand. All right. I'm ready to ask now all those opposed to raise the hand. Now, uh, is there anyone that wants to challenge that vote? Raise your hand again. Raise your hands up high. The nose. The nose up high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Out of what is our total present? But let me ask, are there any here not voting? So the food co-op decided to mark everything up uniformly, 10%, and then went on to discuss how many days a week they'll be open. Just to get a feeling, this is not official. I'm going to ask you first, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Then I'm going to ask you Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and then Wednesday through Saturday. Okay, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. All in favor? Okay, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Okay, uh, Wednesday through Saturday. Okay. <laughs> Now, then the, the greatest number, and I wonder if you would want to make this an uh, addition to the motion. Uh, and then, of course, you can still vote this motion down, that the four days be open 
Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. Now, I'm trying to be just perfectly open and fair. I certainly don't care. Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, all those in favor of that, raise the hand. All those opposed to that, raise the hand. Is there another motion to be put to the floor? Six days. Six days. Six days. I am going to rule no discussion unless I am overwhelmingly uh, objected to. Um, I object. Okay. I'm going to ignore your question. I'm sorry. Uh, all those in favor of a six-day week with the hours being the regular weekday and weekend hours as at present. All those in favor, raise the hand, and we'll count. So is there four? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Not. Wait a minute. Let me. Uh, huh, are you gentlemen still not voting? Okay. Then we still need three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 33 and a half. You have to keep so much cash around so that you can, you can continue to pay your current well, bill. Let's see. If you look at the sheet, we've got about $300 more that we owe people than we have cash in the bank. So if you give away $1,000, that's less cash in the bank you got. And I don't think we can forget right now for the moment the, uh, the tax liability that we're going to face. Because once you distribute the money to groups that are going to put it into use, you aren't going to be able to get it back. And the federal government doesn't give a damn what happens to the money. All they're going to say is they're going to put their tight little fist out and say, feed me. Okay. And, uh, there is, and get, there is one to walk home on the Brighton Road. Give one telephone call and find out if they found some way not to pay tax. Where was this? We found that way. On Brighton Road. Black Co-op. Black Co-op? Yeah. Black Co-op. Black Co-op out there. Yeah, yeah right. Co they come, maybe find some way to avoid taxes. See, a lot of that might be, well, there's also just because <laughs> if you are a uh, Black Co-op, if you don't hire anybody, no, no. you don't Black, have to. Black, Well, there's, there, is, there is one kind of a Co-op that doesn't pay any taxes. <laughs> and it's not it's the kind right. of, if, if a Co-op has a closed membership, and, dis and takes all of its profits at the end of the year and returns it to their members as dividends. Now there are a lot of co-ops, a lot of mail order co-ops work this way. They don't pay taxes because they don't have any income as, a, as, an, as an entity, because they distribute it all. But we, are, we don't do that, and I don't really think, uh, at least from what we talked about last meeting, we don't want to do that. I'm not real clear on this retained earnings. You said that's in the, in the three or four years the co-op's been operating? That's the kind of, that's the ex well, that's the surplus that we've generated. In three years. Well, that's not actually because there's, there's, be there's all the value, all the coolers, every, all the well, no, 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 well, no, those that, so anything that wasn't paid for we've given oh. in, in assets won't go on the balance sheet at a value. The only thing that we bought down there in terms of physical assets, to my knowledge, is the walk-in. And that, including its installation, cost about a thousand bucks. Well, Tom, that doesn't negate the fact that if we wanted to liquidate them, we couldn't get anything for them. Though. No, I agree. I mean, fair market value is what you have. Well, to sure, but value. okay, but we're we're getting off uh, off into the world. Somewhere. Well, so <laughs> how much? What's the tax liability at three thousand dollars? Well, it's, it's the yeah, corporate the right. corporate tax rate is twenty five percent of everything that you make. Everything that we make, we pass to pay twenty five percent. That's seven hundred. Right, we made twenty five. Yeah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's also we penalties and there's also interest. And I, I'm, I'm a law student, and I don't really uh, get off too much on the kind of regulations that they got, if you know what I mean. But uh, they're the boss. They're, they're the people that control all of the strings. And if you don't pay off, they'll go down there and sell every goddamn thing we've got. Yeah, but Jim just said that we only made 300 last year, so even if they take 25% of what we made. Well, that's not true. We made, uh, in terms of profit, $726 last month. Well, no, I said la last year, when the, at the end of the statement, the closing entry at the last year, what was the profit? shouldn't say anything. It should be. It should well, it's not really a profit one. number. And, uh, <coughs> but that's okay. And if you'll notice, I didn't, uh, I didn't tag it with any label. Uh, no, 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 I mean, you don't have the, the last, so the books are closed out as of September. That's the closing of the year. 
No, because we went from September to September. There was only a few hundred dollars, I don't know if it was three hundred, there was only a few hundred dollars in profit shown. Basically, we should have done the book so there should be no profit shown. We should just give it away. Well, even if you give it away, Jim, it doesn't make that doesn't make any difference as far as the feds are concerned. They'll go through your books, and every expense that you don't have listed is thrown out. They'll take every. But even, uh, from what I understand, that even if you donate it to other groups, you still have to keep records of your books on that. It's still considered profit. Exactly. Even, even if you still have to pay taxes on it, unless you do a tax exempt group, so you can write it off with your tax. Uh, I was with the co-op a couple of years ago, and this, the same thing you're, you're hashing over was brought up. Michael Schwartzwalder came to a meeting, and he said he was trying to get the co-op. Uh, he couldn't get a tech, you know, sure. where other companies could give us money and get write-off, but we could get a tax exempt status. And if he, and if we didn't get the tax exempt status. He had figured for the first two and a half years that we would have, had, we would have to pay the uh, federal government about $12,000, and he advised to file a bankruptcy the first day they start sending uh, Right, and that's a smart thing. can reorganize as another right. co-op, right. and they yeah. have to. <coughs> There's nothing else you can do about it. There's no sense, I mean, yeah, but the amount of money. You can only file bankruptcy once every seven years, and it costs $50. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the question I have about that, though, is a lot of the things that the co-op now owns, like the freezers and everything else, when you declare bankruptcy, yeah, yeah, they, 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 they liquidate all of But we'll just business. have to transfer that to a new co-op before we declare right. bankruptcy. It, doesn't make it has to be six months before you declare bankruptcy. You have to transfer all of <laughs> so so this year, year, why, why, why don't we just, just give those coolers away to different people, members? And, uh, <laughs> well, there's not and, uh, you just my, cool, it's my cooler down there, and I'm the head coach. That's all, all there. They're all there. Okay, Jim, which ones do we solve? Let's get this on tape. I'm like, I've got a question. I'm going to get out of here. Wait, order a second. Wait. Order. I just like the only. Well, I'd, I'd like to finish up by saying that I would, I, I think we ought to be putting some money into the savings account, but I don't think we ought to be even thinking about distributing money to anybody at this time, at least until we get some kind of an idea of what it is that we're going to have to pay the feds and what it is that we're going to have to pay the state. And I don't know when, I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's, it's going to happen. I mean, every, every year that the co-op grows, we get bigger and bigger and uh, more and more people know about us, and finally somebody's going to say, hey, you guys haven't been paying any taxes on all this income, and the kind of people that are going to be saying it are people that want to put us out of business. The people like retail grocery stores that just don't really give a shit what kind of a community service we do. Those guys are interested in profit, and everything that we sell is something that they don't sell, and they realize it just as well as uh, everybody else here does. So I, I don't, I don't mean to say that we got to toe the line with respect to everything that the state and the feds want us to do, but at least in terms of our cash flow. There are, there, are, there are legal liabilities that we've got, and we're going to have to pay close attention to them. How can we find out about uh, the option? Yep. Exactly. Well, have my suggestion spell is out what it is that we can or cannot or should or should not do so we can make a decision. I, I would like to make another attempt to get a tax-free status from the federal government. If we can get that, we may be able to work some kind of a settlement by saying that we were always of this, this kind of an organization. We haven't... Uh, really taking any, you know, we aren't ripping anybody off, we aren't taking any profits, so let's just forget it. Now, if that doesn't work, we can still try and get a tax exempt status that will clear us up perspective. We may have some liability for monies that we've, we've earned in the past. But uh, I don't think, as long as we don't try and hide the fact, the feds aren't going to come, come down on our shit and say, okay, you got to pay a $5,000 fine, which they can assess. And it's, and it's up to them. Now, it'll be assessed without even without even court interference. If they want to assess a penalty, they have the right to under the law, and there's nothing that we can say about it. So my my suggestion is, that, and what I intend to do, is to go back through the books as far as I can and generate the kind of data that's, that's going to be necessary to justify all of our expenses, minimize any tax if it be assessed, and then we'll go to the feds and say, okay, we're going to pay off this bill, and we won't, we'll pay it off if you don't charge us any interest and you don't charge us any penalty. That, and assuming that they're going to collect the tax, that's the cheapest we can get off. So far, they haven't been charging interest. They've come down and we've owed them for years. 
so and, far. Uh, well, I, I don't think they're going to hassle us, Jim. I really don't. But uh, yeah, if, if, if we start screwing around and, and give, getting rid of these assets, getting rid of this cash, trying to avoid tax liability, that'll end us up in court. And uh, that's the last place we want to be. Because, uh, well, you need any help. <laughs> you, you should probably then. Is that? I think, I think it really would help to get, to, you know, to, for us to find an attorney, you know, who, who really knows this field. Because, for example, Mark. already got one of you. What's he doing? He's yeah. busy. Who's help. that? Uh, Schwartz. He's the one who us with Len the city Schwartz? tax. And, uh, We've been, or we're going to start working on writing up. Um, I don't know that was his field. Tax it is his field. It isn't. Tax is his field. We went to Lenny Schwartz, and he said the bakery, he told us that the bakery, no way he could get nonprofit tax status. He says he didn't see how he, he did it. Was he talking about nonprofit, charitable? Or no, non nonprofit. That's all he wanted. And we were saying, okay, let us just be a little corporation or a partnership, you know. And he says, okay, that, but nonprofit. That's what he, he used to, has all his experience, experience in Texas. He used to work with a tax no, firm in New York. We went, in Texas was in the uh, military. John Quigley, no, he, he got a He went to New York for an He's a corporate firm. tax lawyer. So That's probably the lawyer's so not Tom, wait a second. Uh, wait, wait, we're still, we haven't come up with it. Whether we're going to take out $1,000 for the summer or... Well, you, you can take it out and put it into a savings account, and that, that will make any difference. Well, I, mean, that's that's, also, I think it's a good idea. I also, I wanted to bring up... You know, I'd like to put 500, another $500 up on the up on the block. To give away? Right. Because well, it takes a month. People have to uh, come in and present what they want to do with that money. Um, so it takes a month. And such. I think. See, we make our money for, from December, January, February, March. After that is when we start we start getting rid of it uh, because of the lower volume and we have to start, you know, we start paying all those bills. So that's the reason we're putting the money away for the summer, but I would say we may as well spend it now, spend $500. You know, my suggestion is to wait. The reason that we should wait is that once that money is distributed, we aren't going to be able to get it back. And we may well need it to purchase Well, goods. that's not totally true. We won't be able to get it back. If we're giving it to community organizations. Say, say we do come up with a bill for $500 and we've given this away. There's no reason we can't go back to the community. Or they've have some, or do they've already spent it. They give the tenant union $100 and it's going to be gone. Well, they they don't don't <laughs> we shouldn't be spending it. Yeah. 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 We want to get non profit status. There's certain places where we spend money we've got to give our money to certain people. Like politicians. I know there are certain things you can't get your money to. So we should find out who we can give our money to. At the next meeting, let's say what's going to happen when we get non profit status. Tom? We have to have certain regulations. I have to go. If there are any questions, uh, please direct. See, we'll end up doing the same thing we always do. Is that Jim, wait, 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 what were you going to try? What were you going to find out for us the next time? How would we go about discovering what our most advantageous status would be? Yeah. Okay. And let us know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Keep in touch. I think that uh, the as far as giving money away, we can set up some sort of a foundation or something within the community to accept this kind of tax free. We can set up some system of dispersing it legally. I don't, see, I don't see that as any problem. That's how this co-op works, is by working within and around and outside of the law. <laughs> so we can work out some hopes to work within it as we're sure possible. I think that's the for you. The more, laws are there, the more laws of the system you follow, the less you can get accomplished. It's just the only way you can go over Then we have to make a decision, I suppose, on whether this money is will or won't be spent. I like, I like to put a motion up, take $1,000 out and go to the bank for the summer. I'll make a motion then. A thousand be put in a separate bank. Okay, what is now we have three thousand to deal with. We don't really have three thousand. Oh, the other thousand. Well, six hundred fifty dollars is up in uh, Ann Arbor, which we can't spend because it's up there. Another thousand, eleven hundred dollars is in the cooler, which we can't spend either. Yeah, well, that is an inventory. It's sitting on the shelf. It's an inventory and stuff. Mostly ready to be sold. See, there's that. Okay, we have twenty-nine hundred seventy-eight dollars and fifty-eight cents. Uh, but of that, that that's pro profit, I guess. Um, of that is included money that we have uh, up in Ann Arbor, six hundred fifty dollars, and plus it's eleven hundred dollars. Makes that's it seventeen hundred dollars. I thought he said it was. No, he said it wasn't included. Oh, then we really have three thousand. 
That's what he said. We so have yeah, three thousand dollars, but we also owe four thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. We have. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that, 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 when we get to that, Tim, right. from understanding this, what do you? How much money do you think we have right now? Well, so you're an accountant, right? If you if you ignore the inventory, we are we are in debt, right? If you ignore the inventory, we're in debt. Well, we can't ignore the inventory. <laughs> so I mean, to, to, to get out of debt, we have to sell some of the inventory that we have down. Right. So we can so we can put well, it aside. Basically, just taking three figures on here, you get an idea of what the situation is. You take the cash, take the inventory. You've got about seven thousand dollars between those two. You take what you owe people, accounts payable. That's four thousand. So you have three thousand. So you've got three thousand dollars left. But that means you have to sell everything that we've got down the store in the way of food. To get that. And it's right. well, we always have that to really. Yeah, but see, that's not a I mean, long I mean, time. We, we sell that in, in, in two I know weeks. We have to buy more to replace it. Right, I know. Has to be well, we're always so running we out of that money. That money's out. tied up. Uh, but see, so aren't you assuming that we're going to always have three thousand dollars worth of stuff on the shelves? Yeah. No. Yeah. But in the summer we won't. <coughs> yeah, but the, you're making the assumption you will. Right. And we're, whereas when you go to have that thing on the shelf and you don't have it on the shelf and you have creditors, it becomes a very stick, sticky situation when they want money. And that's why we got the thousand dollars. That's why we got a thousand dollars for summer. No, I'm just trying to find out how much money. <laughs> we don't well, have, we have it. We in effect, we have three thousand dollars. <laughs> uh, if we sold our inventory, we'd have three thousand in cash. Right. That's right. Okay. And then we'd be out of business. But we always pay, but that's not true. We've never been on the point where we've always bought and always been ahead. We've always owed people. So what? If we if we if we sell this three thousand dollars and we buy three thousand dollars more stock, we owe four thousand dollars as it is now. But that that doesn't mean we don't we don't pay it. We pay it as we go off, so we can easily take out money while we have it. Yeah. Uh, that's right. You look at it that way. We have three thousand dollars. Trying to get ahead of the we have three thousand dollars on the shelves of liquidatable assets. We owe maybe two thousand dollars in bills that won't come due for the next twenty days, and we have almost three grand in the bank. That you know it's, it comes in and goes out. So you could take a grand out of the checking account and put it in another account and let it collect interest, and we and we would still have the same riding bills because they don't come due for twenty days. So you have the cash to take out for another time because you know there's always. You know, at this point, there'll always be two thousand dollars in the bank. That's not doing anything. There's no need to be totally paid up to your up for your bills. Well, I, 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 have a question, I have a question. How much of a how much is the lowest that our balance in the bank in the checkbook is at in any period for one month, say the last month? What is the least amount of money that we have in the bank? It's over a thousand dollars. Yes, oh, we've always been Easy. minus money. Oh, yeah. Easily two thousand. Right. If you look at if you go down and look at the statements. You see that the balance never gets below two grand because if you send the send the checks out, it takes eight days for them to clear. If the bills come in, then they'll come due for two, three, four weeks. Some of them, some of them we only pay monthly, and we. So it's going to cut down. The last. Uh, second is we take one thousand dollars out of the cash out of the checking account and put it into a savings account for the bad times ahead. Right. So, that's basically what we're trying to all get clear in our minds. <laughs> Well, there's no great risk involved. I want to make one comment. I want to just take it out of the bag. We're talking about this. We're talking about this. Okay. I want to make a comment that even though the food co-op's been doing it since its inception, you know, writing checks that they don't have money for. No, we always have money for that. We just may be a month behind on the bill. Oh, a month. We never write bad checks as well. <laughs> and the way it sits now, we're in the best position we've been in since I've been working at the food shop as far as bills go. No bill down there right now is older than eight or ten days old. And our creditors never hassle us unless it gets to a month. And then they'll call us up and go, uh, well, it looks like you've got a little problem here. Because they're more messed up than we are. <laughs> I mean, they don't know what we owe them, really. I mean, they send us statements that are three weeks old for stuff we paid for a long time ago. So that, you know, there's no like problem with taking out a thousand or two thousand dollars. I don't know what your discount rate is on prompt payments, but right now it 
with the inflation uh, the way it is, it's okay to let your bills run as long as you can because you're actually making money from the inflation. Yeah. Right. As long as we don't pay our bills, the more money we have. Oh, Stan, look, we can talk. I don't know what balance is. Most of that is uh, taking, like, it's like, you know, you can get like a 2%. Right. You this about one, one and a half percent. I'd right. like to have you vote it out so you can move on. Yeah. Okay, take a grand out, put it in the bank. <laughs> I. Uh, well, okay. Oh, so 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 my <laughs> God, it's a decision. <laughs> it's good. Right. Go to the bank. It was Tom's recommendation. Tom could do it. Sure. Do it, sure. No, that's the IRS thing. Uh, we've been working on it. Does anybody want to help on that? Uh, what? Write up the actual IRS. Uh, write up. Well, we have to write up our, our, our uh, article of incorporation. You, you don't write that to the IRS, I don't believe. Well, no, we have to write it up. The state of Ohio. Jeff, didn't you say you already had something that they had written up years ago and never <coughs> yeah. okay, that was never filed? Right. It was written up three years ago. Accomplishment that came out of an open meeting for Oh, yeah. Really? <laughs> we finally did something. Yeah, we did something else. We found out that the alternative way of cooling cooler well, wasn't feasible. Well, I'd, I'd say let's get this voted on or get it done quickly, or we can spend all night very on when we're going to discuss these things. <laughs> okay, so, let's uh, do it. Let's, let's just, let's just okay, start. Okay, how about if you leave it up to my discretion and like the things that come in underneath to, this one, you know, like sure. when we're talking, who's? No, that's okay. I'm, I'm sorry. You got to learn to pick. You got to take responsibility. You I was just going to say that, well, that like where, where the membership <laughs> thing comes in and it's already on the agenda, then I'll just throw in what somebody already brought up and throw it in under there. Right. Okay. Remind you just start down there, listening. Okay? All right. I'll go Do you want to skip then the first two about the boycott of the lettuce? And no. Well. Okay, um, the boycott of the lettuce, then. That's where I number one. <laughs> that's Who was that? Who's that's idea? Debbie. That was, no. That was I wanted skip. an explanation of it. Skip was going to give an explanation so that everybody understood the total issue. Because I don't think a lot of people do. Okay, I called up um, the great, great boycott, and they put me in touch with another guy named John Reeder, who I couldn't get a hold of. But, oh, that's you? Good. Uh, maybe you can explain. There's questions about whether or not um, Flora grapes, Flora grapes can, should be bought. If we can get them, can we buy them? Or what's your position on that? Um, well, right now we say all grapes. We're, we're, uh, I don't know how many people. I don't. Does everybody know what? The, I guess most of you probably know better than I do about grape uh, What it entails. But basically, it's a UFW wants to have an election. And there are no rules kept forcing the growers in California, principally California, Arizona, to have a grant the workers election. So they're asking people not to buy grapes, head lettuce, and gallo wine. Mainly gallo, but there's also others like uh, Herbari, but mainly gallo in this area. So we're asking people not to buy any grapes. How about, how about raisins? Go. What? How about raisins? No, not raisins, just grapes. Um, we have an agreement. <laughs> Kind of the gold circle. Um, oh, with and, and on the state of Ohio, and this was a big, uh, big request in our favor. First of all, we're going to be able to negotiate with Big Bear, but then we can The guy I talked to down there said, well, I, he did I don't know who I talked to. He said uh, that he thought if we bought New York grapes or Florida grapes, it would be all right. Well, all right, if you can, get, if you can guarantee that there are New York grapes. Florida grapes. That's the problem, right? Right. If you can guarantee that they are, then, then it wouldn't be too bad. But the trouble is, the wholesalers are always trying to, you know, like we've been uh, negotiating Big Bear, and they say, well, yeah, we're selling headlights. We say union headlights. There is union headlights. It's in our harvest. Now, we would not object to co-op. In fact, this would be to encourage you, if you can get it, if you get a contract with a wholesaler, it's in our harvest is the brand name, and it is UFW lettuce. So we would, we're not against people buying head lettuce that's union. California headless it's union, but there's only one company right now. So if you can get it, um, you know, I think that'd be, that'd be at, at the farm workers benefit dinner, I guess a couple months ago, didn't the guy that speak there say that uh, they are not trying to organize Florida now because right. it would be spreading out the UFW too much? And didn't he say that they were not asking people to uh, boycott Florida grapes? 
Yeah, that's true. But the problem is it's a question of enforceability. You know? In other words, if you can guarantee that, they, that the guy is going to give you four and a half oh, and that's good. But the problem, same thing in headlights. In other words, we have to not to buy headlights because the supermarkets, they, they just lie. There's corporate deception. And they yeah. have headlights one week and the next week we got something else. So if you could guarantee it, the person is fine if you guarantee it. We wouldn't have any objection to that. No, we would, no, we would have any objection to you using uh, inner harvest lettuce. That would be good. Um, I think we've always tried, if the union lettuce comes in, that's our, been all our policy to take it, but it's just never really in much. So we really don't carry much head lettuce. What um, about uh, EF, Bell, CIO, the Mr.'s Union? So, is there any kind of UFW is part of the FLC. Yeah, but the Teamsters is not part of the FLC. Okay, okay, okay. the Teamsters stuff. What about that? Well, that's what we're fighting. Right. So stuff. kind of stay away from that? Yeah. We're asking people to do that. That's essentially it. The, they have other stuff besides just lettuce. Well, the Teamsters, uh, sure. They, they are supposedly representing the agricultural workers in California. They're trying to bust the UFW. That's the Teamsters. It's the agent of the growers. Yeah, that's, what, that's the thing. Everything else is Teamsters or mainly Teamsters. So, uh, and, uh, you know, you know, if you could get the person, in other words, I, I think it'd be, be good if you could get a hold of uh, UFW lettuce and grapes, say Florida grapes or New York grapes, that'd be okay. We're not have to that. There are UFW Florida grapes? Well, they're not UFW. Let's put it this way. They're non-California. The, the strike, it's like, all right, UFW is basically, all right, we do have contracts in with uh, the citrus industry and uh, sugar cane workers. But right now, see, the strike is with uh, lemon industry, lemons, grapes, head lettuce, mainly, and wine workers. So that's where we're at. That's where the boycott strike is. If they can't win in California, they can't win anywhere because that's where the strength is. So does anyone have any ideas on whether or not we should buy a Florida, a Florida grapes? I think we should if we can get them. Yeah. For sure if we're Florida. How can we make sure they're in Florida? This is little carrier. Um, the well, Linda can check when she gets them. Most things are marked where they come from. And like I have enough faith in, in our, our produce buyers that, that uh, she will check and if it is you know, Florida, she'll get it. If, if we ask her, if we specify, you know, get Florida but not California, then she'll do it. We've had, I just want to mention, we've had pretty good success in Ohio. I mean, the, we figured the shipments into Ohio were down about 20% this year over last. And um, so the, the boycott is having an effect, and we figure, we really hope that within a six to eight months that, that they will sign a contract, that the growers will give in. And that's why we're still asking people not to. Work. In the meantime, my thing is, it's like enforceability. And like Big Bear, Big Bear is—they uh, have union lettuce and they don't have them. We have union lettuce and they don't have them. We're picketing over there on Plain, and um, the guy was really pissed off. Uh, his name was the manager, Big Bear, was really the big manager. He said because we we paid show in good faith. We said yeah, but you guys, you know, one day they have, one day they don't, one day they have. You can't tell. You have to look at the box. That the lettuce comes in. No, you can't look at just the head lettuce. So you can't look and say, well, if they go down there and the guy says, sure, I got it. I got union lettuce. Union meaning teamster. Union meaning whatever he wants to be. In other words, it's just a question of if you can, if you can show it, the guys or, or whoever's buying them, so, you know, they should, they should show it. That's the whole thing. Yeah. I don't see too much problem with lettuce, but grapes is the only, the only problem that... People want grapes? Well, I don't know. Some people do. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, I, mean, I haven't eaten grapes for so long that I no longer miss them. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if we should even hassle um, getting them from Florida. If, if you have problems of them switching labels, and that used to be the problem. That was one of the reasons. But that was over a year or so ago that that they had the problem where uh, they were switching labels. Now, if that still goes on, then it's almost impossible to tell where a grape comes from if you look at the box. Have you had any problem with switching labels recently? Uh, or is that no, not really. Uh, mostly it's just a question of whether they mix the two. If you go Gold Circle, like they'll mix uh, Big Bear, they'll mix uh, Head Lettuce, you know, Union Head Lettuce, uh, non Union, they tell the consumers, uh, they tell the people, yeah, it's Union. Good. It's just a question of mixing the two together. Like, maybe you could, if you can trust this, if somebody who sells a produce that you can trust. So I'd say go ahead and do it if you can trust me. 
I think we can trust the people. I think we should go ahead and try to check it out, and if we can get it, do it. I would say if you do do it, uh, do that, you ought to make people aware, though, that you have that stuff and that it's not in violation of boycott. Good point. You have to be organizing this more and you're still supporting that union. I imagine any produce. Uh, I mean, you can't have broccoli and cauliflower. Yeah. 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 Do we want to add one more thing? Because trying to talk about this. Yeah. 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 Yeah
That's why no, I think no, no. we're asking about race. They won't try the reasons in that. So I mean, I, t I just wondering if that's possible. No, it's probably a whole new type of race or no, race. <laughs> What they do well, I vote we should maybe move on because we can spend a whole night talking about this. Yeah, I think it's not So it's not going to matter a whole lot. Ready? Second thing is about the whales. Somebody has to clear them out of the back room. Well, I checked into a boycott, you know. A lot of times, about 25 conservation groups boycotting Japanese products, are trying to form a boycott because of the slaughter of whales in all in the oceans. And um, I couldn't find out anything. It's like the Audubon Society; they write a whole article about it in their magazine, but you call up their local office and they don't know anything about it, and they give you some number or some address to write to, so I could find out and then tell them. So it seems like they don't know what they're talking about to a large extent, and it seems like well, I don't know. There's uh, I don't know about it, really. it's growing in, in national scope, but it's in Boston. And Erwan, which is a warehouse that do about a quarter of a million dollars worth of food to the Japanese yearly, are, they've sent them a rather strong letter asking them not to uh, hassle the whales anymore. Really, because of the buying business they do with the Japanese, they may have an infection problem. But if more people stop buying Japanese products, the Japanese economy, it's going to affect them the cash flow from them that may make a little bit of difference as far as the politics uh, getting something done to stop the oil. It's not that necessary anymore anyhow. Well, the oil, ind oil industry is on its way out. It's just a matter of years before it does go out. Whether or not the oil will be extinct by the time it comes out, it's not going to build any new ships, any more new ships. Once the old whaling ships are on, um, Fall apart, and they're doing it already. And the whaling industry is done for. Because well, the whales. The point I'd like to see the answer is if you can, or you, or anybody's interested, can prove that it's in fact true. What? Just the bring, some, bring some information in here that demonstrates to us that the whale species is in, in danger. That they are in danger. Well, well I told you. I listened to a radio program this morning. And at the end of the program, he said that it was not true. There was no scientific data to show that the whale was in fact on its way out. Even so, even it's not the matter of extinction. Whales are as intelligent as we are. Well, and it's also, that's, I mean, you're affecting so a very high level of consciousness. No, a whale is, can, they don't know for sure if it's as intelligent as we are. So dolphins are the same, they're mammals, they have the same size brain, they have, we don't even know how to measure their intelligence. So what if we're affecting another intelligent well, we species of life on this planet? Is, you know, as evolved as we are, maybe not even more. What's the difference if it's an intelligent species or if it's just a species? Well, our question is, is that the way to boycott it through all the products or maybe, you know, find out who uses it? Well, it doesn't seem like anybody knows about the boycott. People in the Audubon Society aren't hearing terrible about it, so, you know, I think it's... Because where the, our most of the products used for industry? Uh, the whale, the whale. Yeah, well, yeah, most of it goes into uh, cosmetics and dog foods and things like that. And a small percentage is eaten as food in Japan. They do just do it to make money, that's all. Look, look at all the products that are produced in Japan. How are you going to boycott everything? If you're narrowing in on just a well, few items, it might make what sense. What they really want is public support. More or less. This is just Why more Japanese public support. Part Why the Japanese point? Because Japanese and Russia are the two. They're um, violation. Well, there's a whaling council, like, and they're trying to form um, rules. They haven't signed them. Right. They, they haven't signed them. The, the whaling agreement, and they're just slaughtering a lot of whales that are protected under this agreement. So. Yes. Uh, I mean, the president, like the president, right now. Uh, is there any definite information on what the whales, especially as far as the Japanese are concerned, what they're doing with the whales? What do uh, they do with the whale after they kill them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. They make dog food out of the cosmetics. Because uh, I know something that a whale is, you know, that's part of a, you know, I've read someplace that's part of the 
uh, diet of the Japanese. It's less than 2% of the diet. It's not a young thing. Whales are. And it's mostly in institutions where they, they force people to eat it because there's people on choice. But, mm -hmm. Or like, like maybe prisons or something like that. Or the majority of Japanese food. protein comes from soybeans, which are also in the United States. And the fish. fish. And if they keep on slaughtering in five, ten years, there might not be any whales. So they, you know, they really, they, then there's no chance of a harvest whales 20, 50 years from now, 100 years from now. But I think you have to demonstrate that. I don't think it is. Yeah, they said like the blue whale, it's going to take 100 years before they ever become populous enough to even, you know, regain their old numbers. Yeah, well, not even that, to regain their old numbers again from maybe 10 years ago or something. I, I think it's more than obvious. It's been a National Geographic for years. There's been TV specials on it. Uh, you know, just following the numbers. Just National look at the harvest. Is the what they get the harvest in. I think the Sierra Club even got into a little bit now. Well, the fact that the numbers are falling does not mean that they will be endangered. Yes. Well, then yeah. again, uh, to oh. say that a good scientific study has been done on it, you know, doesn't mean that, you know, one thing one way or the other, just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it's not happening. Well, what we really have to discuss here is whether or not a boycott's going to do any good. And it doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of support for a boycott anywhere. You know, I mean, the Audubon doesn't mean boycott of what? Yeah, yeah, just trying to get support, you know. Because right, they, they say if there's enough support, I guess Congress and the President can stop all the products from coming. Maybe it's an alternative. Well, the President can, but you know, he has. The, the boycott of the Japanese products for the food co op is going to affect everybody who eats tamari, miso, uh, buys our surabachis. Tuna, tuna fish, sardines, fish, fish all kinds of things. So it's going to put some people in a bit of a bind. Yeah. It's so not we, we do decide to boycott. So. It's not necessary. So we can easily get the product from the People's Republic of China Well, thank you all what for the measles. I don't know that it's that we have to do it. You're going to be a big uh, runner on measles. Well, okay, why don't you guys <laughs> make <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's put a vote. What if I don't turn into the sources? It might, even, especially in this, uh, China. It's um, <laughs> definitely better to buy in China than Japan. I would say that would be my personal opinion. would rather buy in China than Japan. And I would think that others would. Well, some of those products are starting to be made in America. I mean, I myself made some miso last year. Of course, it takes a couple of years, so I think there's got to be some sources out west somewhere. Maybe we should just research. Okay, let's vote on it. Should we uh, research alternative products? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, oh. uh, I have a lot of things to say about the products from DRC. Uh, ecologically, from Japanese authorities. Eggs, for instance, is the least contaminated eggs we can get it from, from the main. It's not from Japan. Because all the world, the rest of us, has been so contaminated with a chemical. And as you know, that uh, we got our if we got our eggs from uh, Amish farm. Uh, no, the heart is coming from We did produce for a while or something. Right. Now, as you know, 25 years ago, before the Communist uh, People's Republic of China established. By the way, we cannot use communists anymore, as you know, since Nixon's trip. <laughs> <laughs> and, and 25 years ago, we China has been our best customers in import to, uh, to get our eggs, especially well, dry yeah. egg product. But right now, I think since the, um, the trade is gradually resumed, we can probably get most the best organic eggs so far. And, uh, sounds like and, and also the uh, the uh, the tamari sauce, especially since most of us are, have been brainwashed by the word tamari. Practically all the Chinese soy sauce are tamari type. That is, they're made from the soybean fermentation. Now, which is different from the kikumi soy sauce that I like the most because of flavor. 
but it's Kamari soy sauce that most of us would like to have, which is the same as from the hair and from China. This is the remark I want to make. I move that we um, look into alternative sources of supply for the products that we're getting. They come from Japan now, and if we can get them to get them from wherever other sources we can. So, and then we can make the decision some of the time. I said we're making it it's partially a political decision if we do make it. Of the choice of one country versus another as a source of food. And I don't think anything's been demonstrated that that choice needs to be between Japan and China. What? We have to go into the difference between Japan and China. Yeah, that's what yeah. you have to do. You have to study. General consensus. We want to start supporting China. For there's no the difference law. in the quality of the food. There's no difference in the price. And you want to make it a political decision, then you got to demonstrate to me. I think, oh, or to well, us, okay. if you're interested in it, if whoever's interested in it. Well, it's more stemming from the it's extinction of whales, not, you know, political. Yeah. <laughs> I think we ought to put something up, you know, and really get some articles, you know, that are intelligent articles, you know, and put them up and let people want to come through to you. You know, we could say, you know, the co-op is, is going through trying to decide, you know, whether to buy boycott Japanese products or not, and whether to find alternative countries. And let's put some stuff up so people can read it. And yeah, but this is always going to be cluttered again, and we're going to have a big house cleaning. It's terrible. Uh, let's well, just put, put it up in one, one little place. Bring it up to the floor. Uh, no, no, I don't mean that people just bring in stuff. I mean, like, you know, we can find some things. You know, this is a co-op related so we've got a university here, and there ought to be a few people that maybe really know something about it, you know? Stuff, so. the okay, I make a motion that we somewhere. assign a committee to, to research the project and bring it up to the next to the next meeting. I'll demonstrate yeah. to people. I, I would prefer to see materials hung up down there so people between now well, and I'd see both of them, but I'd like, I'd like somebody to research it and have something concrete here the next time so that we don't run into a bunch of people saying, no, you know, we don't have enough information. You know, well, I think that's fair. Hubbard has a point. We don't have enough information, so uh, let's get it together and let's have it here. You know, not just downstairs, but here at the meeting. Well, let's have it downstairs also okay. so we can read it. Somebody just has to get it. Okay, who wants to do it? Okay.